Good afternoon. Welcome to the sixth annual Senior Showcase. We are delighted that you are joining us today to hear from five undergraduate students who have created exemplary research theses and projects across a broad spectrum of subjects and fields. I am Molly Keener, the Scholarly Communication Librarian here at the Z. Smith Reynolds Library, and I have had the pleasure of coordinating the Senior Showcase since its inception in 2010. From the beginning, the Senior Showcase has been intrinsically student-focused. It was founded upon the suggestion of a Wake Forest senior who was so inspired by the rich diversity of his peers' research projects that he wanted a forum where the entire campus community had the opportunity to hear and not just those within the department or within a specific seminar course. He pitched his idea to the Dean of the Library, Dr. Lynn Sutton, who in turn put the two of us together and through our collaboration, the Senior Showcase program came to be. Nominations for this year's showcase were submitted earlier this semester by students, faculty, advisors, several of whom I'm pleased to see are with us today. Final selections were made by a jury panel of library faculty. Selection decisions were based upon both the strength of the faculty nomination and review of the students' works. Five students were selected, representing the diversity of fields and departments that comprise our undergraduate college. The 2015 Senior Showcase honorees are Shoshana Golden, nominated by Dr. Simone Karen of History, Caroline Husky, nominated by Dr. Andy Rodeker of East Asian Languages and Cultures, Rachel Rhine, nominated by Dr. Morna O'Neill of Art, Rachel Brown, nominated by Dr. Sarah Lisher of Politics and International Affairs, and Courtney Smith, nominated by Dr. Patricia Dos Santos of Chemistry. Each honoree will share her research in 12 to 15 minute presentations and we do ask that you hold all questions for a joint question and answer period following all presentations. To conclude the showcase, we do hope that you will stay and visit with our honorees during a reception, which is sponsored by the Undergraduate Research and Creative Activities Center. Special thanks to Associate Dean of the College, Ann Boyle, for Eureka's ongoing support of the Senior Showcase. Without further ado, I introduce today's first presentation, which is from Shoshana Golden. Shoshana created an interdisciplinary major in global health and is double minoring in Jewish studies and Middle Eastern and South Asian studies. Shoshana is from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Following graduation, she will be working this summer for the federal government at the Office of Pandemics and Emerging Threats in Washington, DC. In the fall, she will enter a Master of Public Health program at Yale University to study global health policy. Shoshana. All set, cool, awesome. So I am Shoshana Golden, and today I'll be talking with you about the land of milk, honey, and motherhood, the state of so we hear a lot about Israel in our American media, but we typically hear about Israel in relationship to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We hear a lot about bombings and a lot about terrorism, but what we don't tend to hear about is the effects of this conflict on everyday women's lives. So today, I want to talk to you about Israeli pro-natalism, the pressure for parenthood. To start with, a little bit of background about Israel. Israel is the size of New Jersey, with a population that is just under that of New York City's. Pretty small country. It has a universal healthcare system that encompasses all of its citizens, Jewish, Muslim, Jews, Christian. The highest IVF in vitro fertilization rate per capita in the world, and that is due to exactly what I'm gonna be talking about today. They're incredibly generous in fertility policy. In comparison, to other nations that offer between four to six IVF cycles for women up until the age of 42, Israel goes above and beyond. It offers unlimited infertility treatment up until the age of 45 
or the live second birth of a woman's child. This is truly exceptional throughout the world. While I was in Israel two summers ago, working for Isha La Isha, a feminist grassroots organization that focuses on policies that affect women's lives in Israel, I, got, I became fascinated with this topic and the extreme example that Israel provides. And so over winter break this year, I went back to Israel. I was up in Haifa, right on the coast right up there, um, studying this topic, doing surveys and interviews, which I'll talk a little bit about later. Okay, so I want to start today with a story of a woman that I met in an infertility clinic in Haifa, Israel. Hannah was sitting in Ron Bon Clinic, waiting for her next doctor's appointment, in a stream of endless doctor's appointments, and I was sitting in this infertility room, trying to get women to talk to me about their experiences and their stories. So Hannah and I struck up a conversation, and she told me that she had 11 children at home. I was shocked and very curious, and I asked her, well, if you have 11 children, like, why are you sitting in infertility treatment? Like, what's going on? <laughs> and she explained to me that she and her husband hadn't been quite sure that they were ready to stop having children because, as I'll talk about a little bit later, the first commandment in the Torah is to be fruitful and multiply. And so they had consulted their rabbi, and the rabbi had said, you know, stroke the beard, like, <laughs> had said, you should have 12 children like the 12 tribes of Israel. So Hannah and her husband went back at it and had some struggles. <laughs> and so here she was sitting in the infertility treatment center. While Hannah's story is an extreme example, it's not absolutely unusual. I talked with one woman sitting in an infertility treatment room who had undergone 17 IVF cycles that were all paid for by the state of Israel, which is truly exceptional. So, that's what I want to talk about today. How does this conflict affect real women's lives? So to get a sense of this, I interviewed a hundred, like, I surveyed a hundred women. I did not interview them. <laughs> I interviewed 11 of them. Um, so I interviewed some physicians, in particular people that dealt with infertility treatment. I talked with women of all three religions. I talked with leaders of various NGOs that are affected by this issue. And of course, I focused in on anyone who was willing to talk to me. So I thought some other people just who happened to be interested in the topic. Um, to be able to talk with this diverse population that I was dealing with, I got some translators. So it is valid Arabic and Hebrew translation. Um, I only took one semester there, so mine was not about to cut it. <laughs> <laughs> and so here we are. So this topic, I think, all comes back to the demographic struggle of the state of Israel, a Jewish state, the only Jewish state in the world. Israel is 75.4% Jewish, 16.9% Muslim, 2.1% Christian, and 1.7% Jews, all of which you can see up there. So, the Jewish state of Israel obviously has the Jewish government, which does have Muslim political parties and influences. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But the first thing that I thought was really interesting with studying this topic is how the Jewish government has responded to their pro-natalist <sighs> pressures, right? So one year after Israel was founded, in 1949, David Ben-Gurion, who was the first Prime Minister of Israel, decided that they needed an award for women who had gone above and beyond in the service of their country by having 10 or more children. And he made it a real thing, right? This happened. And it was only shut down 10 years later when the Israeli government realized that they had actually awarded more Muslim women this special honor than Jewish women. Which was a very awkward moment for them. They like put it down there and was again. Whoops. Um, but this infertility treatment policy is just one in a long line of examples of the Israeli government trying to promote Jewish families to have more children. On the other hand, there's a huge push from Muslim political leaders and community leaders to have larger families of their own. There's two responses typically to this, this feeling. So one, which is a larger understanding of the issue, is that Muslim families need to have as many children as possible to reclaim the majority of Israel. The second is don't have so many children, invest in the few children you do have, education, promote them, they'll become middle class professionals, they'll really become leaders in the state of Israel. But currently the first approach is much more popular, which means that the Muslim population is really growing right now in the state of Israel. So you might have noticed that I don't talk about Christians at all in the study. In part this was due to where I was located in the city of Haifa, but also due to lack of time. I hope to go back one day. PhD. <laughs> 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 um, and then the Druze. 
So the Druze are called the fourth Abrahamic religion. They are an offshoot of Shia Islam, way, way back several hundred years ago. And they have been persecuted, very intensely persecuted, for the last several hundred years. So they are an incredibly secret religion. They exist in Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, and Israel. There's only about 125,000 of them in Israel. Um, so they're a very small population that doesn't really get affected by this demographic struggle between the Jewish and Muslim populations. Cool. Okay. So this whole tension of having children is in part due to the religious struggle, but in part amplified by religion itself. Religion has become a vehicle to encourage women to have more children. And we see this through quotes from various biblical texts, whether it's the Torah, the Quran, or the more secretive texts of the Jewish community, which they don't share with outsiders. So studying them was a bit of a challenge. <laughs> um, so one of the first things is that consistently infertility in these religious texts is viewed as a curse, <laughs> only to be lifted with prayer and devotion to God, to the ultimate being, right? On the other hand, you're getting a lot of messages to be fruitful and multiply. There's one passage in the Torah that says, have as many children as there are stars in the sky, or sand by the ocean, which clearly is not about to happen anytime soon. <laughs> but they're still saying it. Um, and of course, that children are the ultimate blessing. So as part of this constant encouragement, you have, and this is part of what I was studying, um, I conducted all of these surveys, right, that I was just telling you about before. And the Muslim women that I surveyed said that 77.1% of them said that their religious community and or religious leader was encouraging them, if they couldn't have children, to pursue infertility treatment. That there was this really strong sense that having children was so important to fulfilling your life and your religious obligations. In comparison, 49% of Jewish women said that they felt in a similar way, compared to only 10% of the Druze. The Druze were a really interesting case. I actually started studying them by accident, by surprise. They got into my sample size, and I was like, this is really interesting. I've never seen any answers like this before. And then I actively started pursuing Druze women to get their sense. But they said, really, that the religious community doesn't get involved in their decision to pursue infertility treatment or to have children. That there's such a divide between the religious leaders who are so um, knowledgeable about the religious doctrine and the rest of the Druze community that they just don't discuss it. And it's up to the women themselves. Okay, so because of all of this pressure to be fruitful and multiply to have these children, one woman I interviewed actually said that in Israel, one has become the new zero, which is an exceptional message, right? Having one children is no longer seen as like anything at all, which is pretty huge. Um, and they said that in part of this, you can feel it everywhere. So one woman said, one Muslim woman said, that it felt like having children was not an option. It was the default setting, the only setting, and that having one child was also not an option. She was going to have three or four children. It was just assumed it was almost guaranteed. Um, a Jewish woman said that when you want to have a child, the nation rallies behind you in support. She said that your friends, your parents, the grocer down the street will be sure to like support you in your decision to have a child. You know, you might get like free groceries here, cooked meals there, but if you decide not to have a child, Everyone, everyone starts asking you why. And so there's this constant nagging, this pressure. One of the women I surveyed said that when she went in for her PhD program to the registrar of her department, the woman, when she said, how are you, wouldn't look into her eyes, but she looked at her uterus, right? Her stomach was like, is there a baby there? And she was like, the baby is not important to who I am. This is not, this is not part of your life, this is my life. But there was such a, a feeling that it was acceptable to talk about women's bodies in relationship to having children. And so that brings us to this, the ideal number of children. And I asked women, how many children do they want to have? And there is a statistically significant difference between the Muslim women who said about 4.1 and the Jewish women who said about 3.1. I was surprised by this when I first saw this in my statistic professor's office who I'd gone to for help <laughs> with all of the analysis. Um, because I had assumed that with the Jewish government pressuring so much to have multiple children, that there would be more of a sense of Jewish women feeling like they had to build up these numbers. But actually, upon doing a little more jinky and reflection, I think it really stems back to what we talked about before, or I talked about. <laughs> um, that Jewish women are, of course, receiving a lot of this messaging from their neighbors, from their government, from everyone. But the Muslim women are experiencing even more messaging, even stronger, 
even stronger messaging, that they need to have more children. They need to regain the sense of the population. Cool, okay. So, to sum this all up, there's a huge amount of national pressure on Jewish, Muslim, and Jewish women to have children. And in part, and this is what I thought was incredibly interesting, it's because Israel doesn't feel like it has any natural resources, right? It has the Dead Sea Minerals, which I don't know if you've had them, but they're great. Um, but they can't really export them on a great level without destroying their environment. They don't really have water, they don't really have land. What they have is people. And they have the brains, the innovation, the entrepreneurial spirit of Israel. So Israel has consistently in the last couple of decades been referred to as the startup nation. They're a country that has built itself off of the minds of their people. And so, you see this with a couple other examples. Israelis created a cell phone battery, the USB. They recently sold ways to Google Maps for $1 billion, which was huge for them, right? Um, and there's also this sense, in addition to having to build up their innovative techniques, that they have to support the country. And so there's a lot of feeling that women who don't have children are selfish, because they're not providing that military support that Israel needs to continue existing amongst its very hostile neighbors. So, I would like to sum up my whole message by saying that women, on both the Jewish and the Muslim side of this conflict, are experiencing extreme amounts of pressure to have children. And that this is something that we don't typically talk about. We talk a lot about this conflict in relationship to um, diplomacy and political landscapes and the actual territories themselves. But until we talk about the women and the way their lives are being affected, we really don't get a full sense of what this conflict is. Thank you so much for listening. Our second presenter this afternoon is Caroline Husky, who is double majoring in Chinese and economics. Her father is a diplomat, so she does not claim a single hometown, as she moved every three to four years from India to Kenya to China to Taiwan to Washington, D.C. Last summer, Rachel started a company in San Francisco with three Chinese software engineers, and she will be returning to San Francisco in June to work for TripAdvisor on their Asia-Pacific business development team and to continue working on her co-founded startup, Parallax. Caroline. Thank you all for being here today to listen to our presentations. Um, um, and today I want to talk about um, basically the two sides of the negotiation on civil society in China today. Um, and what I'm talking about is this dual relationship. So first you have on one hand the Chinese medicines. Um, when I say medicine, I mean someone that's an active participant online in China. So maybe political activi activism or social activism. Um, and then the other side of the, the uh, negotiation is Chinese censors um, from the Chinese Communist Party, which I'll reference as the CCP. Um, and you see the dual negotiation process working as netizens taking advantage of the advances of technology in order to express their opinions online, using new platforms that come out, and using um, innovation and satire um, in a really unique way. And then on the other side of this negotiation, um, we see the censorship bureau of the CCP getting more and more savvy online and figuring out ways to um, maintain control while allowing people to still express their opinions. Um, oh, it moves. Um, <laughs> um, so I wanted to start by showing you um, or talking about a recent case study that happened just last month in March um, to give you an idea of how um, the current process works. Um, so a woman named um, Chai Jing, um, she's, she's a very famous um, TV host on the state-run media, uh, national media, CCTV. Um, she came out with a documentary that was kind of in a TED Talk style, similar to this, um, and it was posted on the CCTV website. Um, and it was about the environment, it was about environmental concerns, specifically air pollution, um, and she took a personal interest in this when she had a young child with health problems. Um, and so she was really focusing on what does air pollution and environmental issues mean for the next generation of Chinese youth. Um, and her documentary 
went viral immediately. Um, within the first week, it had 200 million views. People were talking about it in the hundreds of millions, posting online. It got this discussion really reinvigorated, a discussion that's always been there um, in China under the surface and has um, come up at different points. Um, but it really brought it back up to the surface. Um, and it was a hard-hitting documentary, which at first the um, environmental minister came out and praised it and said, um, this is really something that's very important to our society. Thank you for speaking up. Um, but as discussion got kind of um, broader and broader and more people got involved, um, this sort of mass discussion became um, a, a threat to the government in a sense. Um, and this is what we see constantly as social movements occur. When it reaches a certain scale, the government will censor it. Um, so in this case, after about a week, the video was taken down from all platforms. All discussion of um, Under the Dome was censored. Of course, discussion happened around this um, by not using the word Under the Dome. Um, so it really, it really was a complete shutdown of, of the video itself. Um, and then, coincidentally, so this, this whole thing was referred to as the dome effect, this whole discussion um, and the hundreds of millions of people that, that have been talking about this online. Um, in response, however, um, just two days after the video was removed from, from online, the national, annual National People's Conference, Congress, sorry, was held. Um, and this is all the, the major leaders of China getting together, making policy decisions, and announcing them to the public. Um, and during this Congress, that while the documentary wasn't outright mentioned, it was pretty much ignored, the focus of the entire Congress was environmental issues. And the focus that Xi Jinping, the president, put out and the messages he put out focused on this discussion that was, that was going on in the country. Um, so this is really how we see civil society playing out. Um, from the Western point of view, a lot of Western media sources would say the government shut it down and then manipulated information to, um, to say that they had thought of this idea the whole time. You guys are just you know, talking about something we're already working on. But actually, it's a direct response to um, the video and to the outbreak of public opinion on this topic. Um, so this is how it's being negotiated um, under the authoritarian control. Um, it's, it's, very, um, it's very indirect, but at the same time, it is addressing the problems that people are talking about. Um, and also, the Minister of Environment changed his tune but, um, by not mentioning the documentary, but also mentioning the problems. Um, so looking at how the government has used the internet over the past two decades since its inception in China, um, the focus really has been on um, economic development, and that's because that's what really catered to public opinion. In the late 80s and early 90s, people wanted a better standard of life, they wanted a better quality of living, they wanted longer lifespans, they wanted higher income. So the government um, really focused on bringing that to them, and the rest kind of fell by the wayside, so that was the priority. And this meant that bringing the internet in in the early 90s was actually a tool the government used to legitimize its control. Um, and that means that by um, improving people's standards of living through the internet, which they saw as a great source of economic growth, they could kind of put free speech and um, democratization by the wayside, and for a while, environmental reforms. Um, this is something um, Under the Dome is bringing to the forefront again. Um, so at first, when the internet was first introduced to China, it was called the Information Superhighway. And it was seen as this way to catch up with the global economy. Um, the isolated economy of China desperately needed some infusion of, of um, commerce and introduction to the global economy. Um, so coming from this point of view, um, there are two, two sides of the story. On one hand, the government does see the, the economic potential of the internet, but they also see the potential threat of masses organizing together. Um, and then on the other hand, if you read these quotes, they're just the dual sides, but on the other hand, people see the internet as, um, as a means of freedom of speech and a means of subversion of this um, censorship that's put upon them. So looking at just the past of what the Chinese government has done, this is a quick overview um, and just an example I thought was amusing. Um, when, when the internet was introduced, the central government centralized all internet servers in Beijing. 
So while we're here debating whether Google or Facebook releases our data to the NSA, the government had it all along in China, so there's no you know, requesting for it. They have all the data um, under their property. Um, and so they introduced the, the Great Firewall, as we called it. They called it the Golden Shield Project in 2003. Um, and a really funny, they've been experimenting with censorship all along, which is interesting to see from an outside point of view. Um, but might be confusing in 2006 when these little characters would pop up if you searched the wrong term online and suddenly they say, you can't do that. Um, so Jing Jing Cha Cha, that's a play on the word Jing Cha, which is police in Chinese. Um, and, so, and so all along the, the government has really been um, experimenting with censorship. Um, then looking at the other side, the netizen side, um, we've seen this growth in online contention and really the use of satire to, to get a message through and to talk about things they're not allowed to talk about. Um, so this is a very famous artist, Ai Weiwei. Um, the joke here is the word Sauni Ma means two things. One means F your mom, and one means grass mud horse. So people online were saying grass mud horse, the characters, as a homonym for F your mom. And that was a reference to um, censorship and the government and the frustration at being censored. Um, and the other, the crab here, Hsia, is a homonym for harmony, which is what the government uses when they say we're creating harmony by using authoritarian control. Um, so I went away to this piece that um, he called Sangima Dan Zhongyang, which is a homonym for F your mom, Chinese Central Party. <laughs> um, and it, it really goes a million different directions from here, homonyms, code words, puns. This is just to give you an idea of, you know, a very amusing way that, that it's been used. Um, and he has this great quote that says, you know, I'll sum it up, basically, there's no freedom of speech, there's no voting, there's no democracy, but they do have a grass mud horse which means they do have this ability to use the internet for online contention um, in a very subversive and satirical way, um, but it's still, it's still allowing a form of civil society. Um, so just, I'm gonna go through a few quick examples of, of um, online contention and the players that are out there. Um, so there's a platform co called Sina Wave. Well, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of it. It's a, Microblogging platform similar to Twitter, it's often compared to Twitter. Um, and on Weibo, there are these people called Big Vs or Davies. Um, they're verified accounts of celebrities and um, major political figures, major um, social figures, etc. Um, and what they say online really matters. This is kind of not not strong, um, but you can see maybe that this guy has 50.9 million followers and she has 75.3 million followers. And that was like two weeks ago when I checked, so she might have five million more by now. Um, and that is bigger than you know the audience of some national media sources. So what they say is very closely monitored and also has a really big impact. Um, Hong Kong, who some people call the Oprah of China, um, when Ai Weiwei was arrested, she created the reference to that Ai Weiwei because his his name was blocked by censors, um, and that phrase caught on to millions um, when they wanted to talk about his arrest. Um, Li Kaifu, the ex-head of Google in China, um, he has been kicked off of Weibo, and he's now living in Taiwan in kind of a self-exile to avoid arrest because he spoke out too um, forcefully against censorship. Um, and Yao Chen, who's a very famous actress, um, constantly plays with the line of censorship and the line of what's allowed online, and that's why she's, you know, she's still online today. Well, Lee Kai Fu is not. Um, so one example I wanted to give of how the government experiments with online censorship is the Wenzhou train crash. Um, it was a very fatal crash and also a very public one. Millions online were talking about it, um, and for the first time, the government allowed people to talk about it. So it wasn't shut down immediately. People were talking and people were upset. And the government allowed people to investigate. So they investigated the crash and found that local corruption was most likely the cause. Um, and as a result, a few months later, the local uh, railway minister was arrested 
this allowed the government to kind of use this, the situation as a win-win. So um, we let you speak up, and we also um, take care of the problem. Um, this is a funny one that came up. Um, sorry that my notes are complex, but um, this is a funny one that came up in 2012. This guy, a local official, was seen smiling at the scene of a really fatal crash. So people were angry, and they started looking up his name. And in their search, which they call human flesh search, sounds weird in <laughs> translation, but um, they found that he has a different multi-thousand dollar luxury watch in every picture, and his salary definitely doesn't afford that. Um, so as a result, they named him Brother Watch, and jokes emerged, etc. And he was recently, um, after that, sorry, in 2013, was sentenced to 14 years in prison. So this is a case where netizens really did the corruption research for the government. Um, and then Boshi Lai's trial, some of you might have heard of that, um, was streamed for the first time. It was a live trial on Weibo. That's never been done before. And the government was expecting people to see him as a villain. But this you know, experiment in transparency instead resulted in people feeling empathetic for him and feeling like he was trustworthy. Um, and that kind of backfired on them. But as a result, Weibo was then seen as more of a mainstream media source. Um, and in the past year of 2013, um, followed by pretty strict censorship um, and this trial, the active usership of Weibo has declined pretty significantly. Um, so that brings me back to Under the Dome, and hopefully a quick conclusion. Um, Under the Dome gives us an example of what's the current status quo. Um, and this is a really ongoing negotiation process. I mean, I've been writing my thesis for a year, and this just came out last month and changed how I thought about a lot of stuff. So it's, <laughs> so it's, um, it's pretty constantly changing, um, which is the coolest thing about it. As new innovation comes out, netizens have new ways to speak up. As the government becomes increasingly more savvy, they have new ways to censor and manipulate information. Um, so as um, just a final point to leave you with, this decline in Weibo usership has also been matched by an increase in active users on the platform called WeChat, which is a very popular chat app. Um, and obviously, you don't reach 90 million people with a chat. Rather, you would reach your immediate circle. Um, so people see this as kind of the next step in evolution towards a private sphere of civil society. Um, it's less threatening to the government, but the discourse still continues. Um, so I think this is an interesting next step, but you know, next month it could it could change. <laughs> <laughs>
has been basically neglected in scholarship. The most I was ever able to find in one source on him was five pages, which made this research really fun, you can imagine. <laughs> So oh. it's also unfortunate, though, because it hides really a lot you can learn from this particular series, which really, I believe, is an early example of an artist interacting with a marketplace versus a patron in a time when markets were first starting to emerge. So my question was, why did William Ashford, one, paint this three times, and two, change the figures in particular in each version, which we refer to as staffage um, in this context. And I believe this is all in response to Marketplace. So this paper really started um, when I studied abroad at Trinity College in Dublin. I took a class that was a survey of Irish art and was absolutely fascinated by 18th century Irish travel art. Travel to Ireland is not a new thing in any way, shape, or form. In the 18th century, you saw large amounts of travel within Ireland and also from the outside with the British coming over to see this beautiful natural landscape and natural phenomenon. And what you saw emerge was a very early on marketplace for this art of these famous locations, essentially 18th century postcards. <laughs> so in this, for this work, um, for this project, I really focused in on the figures, particularly because that was what initially attracted me to this. Or these figures right here, which are only in the second version. In the first and third version, you see a really nice little lady getting out of a boat, very quaint, pretty. And here, I'm so sorry, these images are not really projecting super well. This is two really well-dressed gentlemen, an extremely well-dressed woman, very obviously not locals, interacting with two Irish beggar children. A little bit awkward in what's otherwise a really calm, glorious scene. And as you see, they disappear in the other two versions. So I'm gonna focus in on these figures as for this, for this talk, even though there were other things that he did in these, in these paintings to affect the market. So it helps a little to understand what was the state of Ireland in the 18th century. So basically, Ireland is being pulled into Britain at this point. There's been waves of colonization for hundreds of years, but at this point, Ireland still has its own government. It has a parliament with very limited um, power, and it has an executive body, but the executive body is being appointed by the English government. They are under the English king, and the English parliament can actually legislate for them. And in 1800, the Irish Parliament actually voted to dissolve itself in what's called the Act of Union in response to public pressure after the peasant revolts of 1795 and an immense amount of bribery and corruption among the politicians involved, essentially ending the country of Ireland and merging the two officially. But we're already seeing a lot of similarities between the two areas, especially in the upper classes. In Ireland, you have two main upper classes. You have the Anglo-Irish, who are the descendants of the English settlers, and the Gaelic Irish lords. Both really have much more in common with the English upper class and spend a lot of time in England actually and have very little in common with the rural Gaelic population. They also have a major interest in the picturesque. So what is the picturesque? This is one of the most difficult terms to define in all of our history. It is essentially something that has the appeal as it would in a picture. So everyone clear? <laughs> this was first um, presented by William Gilpin in the mid 1700s. He said there was an appeal that wasn't traditional beauty. It was things that were rough, that interact with light, that show interest and color. Things that might not be beautiful on their own, like a crumpling church, but are really nice to look at. So this really takes the emphasis not only on traditional beauty, but on the method of viewing. So this made it really interesting for especially the middle class that it's emerging and they're starting these new marketplaces because it's putting the power in the viewer. So the upper class have always owned the land, but now the middle class can look at it and they can look at it in a certain way that essentially is showing that they have taste and that they have a way of controlling it in a way. Makes a really interesting dynamic and made this a really popular movement, not only in the upper and middle, but the middle class. And so you see not only people buying picturesque landscapes, but going on picturesque tours, going to locations that were famous for being particularly picturesque, including Killarney. 
Killarney was one of the most famous of these locations, particularly this location called the Meeting of the Waters. And this was where the upper and the lower lakes meet under the old Weir Bridge. A weir is a dam. So half of this bridge is blocked off, creating a channel for the rest of the water. But the uh, current went too fast for boats to go opposite it. So it was really famous because the boats would have to dock, the passengers get up, get off, have a nice little walk up the river, and then get picked back up after the boatmen had done all the dirty work to get it under the bridge. So this is not only a really picturesque location, but it was memorable to everyone who had gone there making it a really good decision to depict for someone who wants to sell a lot of paintings. <laughs> so here we see it about 100 years later in a depiction. So not only has he picked a great location, he has to decide how he's going to present it. And so that's where we come into this, to the staffage. And what's really important here is to realize these are contemporary figures. And he emphasizes this by being extraordinarily detailed um, extraordinarily detailed in his costume choices to the point that you can pinpoint the decade of the clothing the women are wearing. So this first one, who's also, I only use one image here because in the first and the third it's the same woman. Um, she's wearing what was called a shawl cloak and a small chip hat over high coof, which was really popular in the 1770s but was starting to go out of style. And then in the middle version, we have an extremely stylish woman. Like she's wearing top of the line, new riding jacket, um, a big hat. All these styles were going to come about in the 1780s. But in 1779 meant that not only was she upper class, she was aware of fashion, which meant she was high in society. Therefore, from somewhere, in, somewhere where she would get access, maybe the capital, Dublin, or from England. But these aren't locals. These are travelers. And that's what makes this really awkward. So <laughs> <laughs> why am I really interested in these figures so much? Because you don't see rural figures in Irish art, especially at this time. You might see like a nice little picturesque peasant in a cart somewhere, but it's really rare and you never see them with the upper class. Absolutely so incredibly rare to see this for reasons that I'm going to explain. But what I think he's doing here is because he is attempting to really position himself well in this market, he's using figures that were popular in the British marketplace. So there is a really strong um, picturesque peasant tradition in Britain. And there were a lot of reasons for this, mainly what was going on in England at the time. You have the agricultural and industrial revolutions and their growth of cities. So there's this major um, idealization of the countryside. So you see these images of really picturesque cottages and everyone's being kind of romanticizing the countryside because it's disappearing. And also the situation of the poor is getting more difficult. So if you present them as happy, that means they have to be. And so this has been, a lot of art historians, including um, Anne Birmingham and John Barrell, have said this nullified the guilt of the upper classes. So you see this really picturesque peasant emerging that the upper class can sympathize with, can, be, can say that, oh, well, we can help them because they work hard, but they just can't quite make ends meet. But we don't have a reason we have to. So essentially, it pacifies their guilt. So if this works so well and was so popular in Britain, why doesn't it work in Ireland? And this is because of the different social context, in my view. So what we see in Ireland is a vastly different economic and social context, especially in the divide between the upper class and lower class. Yes, it's the 18th century. There's a lot of, there's not quite equality in classes going on here. But the situation in Ireland was so much worse. You have an extremely prospering upper class who are consolidated in Dublin and on the estates and a lot of absent landlords. Most of the upper class are really spending a significant amount of time in England and neglecting the rural population. These pictures were extraordinarily difficult to find. They're from about 100 years later. And I, it took me a long time to find them because you don't see depictions of the rural classes, because they're ignored in art like they were in real life. 
the tenants were really neglected by the landlords they paid huge rents they had no incentive to do any sort of improvements to the lands themselves because their rent would be raised or be taken away from them so not only do we have a slower agricultural and industrial revolution we have very little incentive on the part of the lower classes to improve things themselves and so it's just making the situation much worse also there was a increase in population of 1.5 million in 20 years during this time. So mass poverty going on. And you notice this in these travel logs. The English especially will, come, will talk about these horrible huts and how unpicturesque the peasants are here. Like, why aren't they like so pretty like our English peasants? Why aren't they behaving? Um, so this is why we're seeing really a different situation that makes this unacceptable. Because in England, the situation, it wasn't great, but it was such that they could use art to counteract it. But the situation in Ireland was far too drastic for them to be able to really use the art to pacify it. So it was better to ignore it present the upper class, present the landscape, present the beautiful things, and just don't talk about it. So this is why Ashford's made a major mistake. He's attempted to use something that was highly successful somewhere else in the wrong context, and very obviously realized what he had done, because not only do you see these images removed in the next version, in other paintings that he did of travel locations, such as this one, you don't see them again. He focuses solely in on the travelers, on the upper class, on showing that this is a great place to go. This is a beautiful, picturesque location, but leaving out those picturesque peasants. So now that he's realized what is going on in the setting, probably because of the market, he did three of these, so obviously someone was buying them but he must have had some sort of feedback or realized what was going on. You see them removed in the final version, and we're back to these people getting off the boat, really showing where they are, because this is a memorable thing to get off the boat in Killarney, and also avoiding this tension. So this is really an interesting time because you see the emergence of markets instead of patrons in art. You see this travel industry grow, and you also see artists directly interacting with the markets and with the societal context to best position their art to make a profit. And so that is why we see this series and why I've been so fascinated by it. So I hope that y'all enjoyed my little talk and didn't get too, <laughs> too confused. But, um, and also I would really quickly like to wish happy birthday to my mother. Thank you for proofreading this so much you could have given the presentation yourself. <laughs> Our fourth presentation this afternoon is from Rachel Brown, who is double majoring in business and enterprise management with a concentration in international business and politics and international affairs. She is minoring in global trade and commerce studies. Rachel is from Westlake Village, California, but will remain in North Carolina following graduation when she joins Ernst & Young Financial Services Office in Charlotte as a business advisor. Um, so hi, my name is Rachel Brown, and my topic is called Basel III and Financial Inclusion. So the paper is primarily a discussion topic looking at the regulatory response to the financial crisis and what some of the unintended consequences are on socially vulnerable groups in developing countries. So what started as a pretty narrow policy review um, quickly turned into a very complex web of interconnected and conflicting interest. And I was a bit overwhelmed um, diving into this topic. But my primary takeaway was learning just how interconnected the global economy really is. Um, just a quick preview. First, I'll mention some background just on what the terms are and what the current levels of financial inclusion are today. Second, I 
well, first I'll go through the research questions. Second will be the background. Third, I'll go through the different measures I used um, to look at levels of inclusion. Fourth, looking at unintended consequences. And finally, some suggestions moving forward. So the primary motivating question for this research topic was, will Basel III materially affect uh, financial inclusion? So although there's a pretty, um, I was able to kind of recognize this gap at a theoretical level, um, I wanted to look more closely at has it actually affected people on the ground and how to go about measuring that. Um, so as I mentioned, um, it quickly became much more um, interconnected and multifaceted than I anticipated. And so I was able to kind of divide the topic up into four different categories and four different driving questions. Um, one being how global banks and governments were responding to the requirement, two being what the relationships were between the variables, three, oh, three how measures um, of inclusion differed um, along gender and income levels, and finally how Basel III affected the credit gap for small business owners. So what is financial inclusion? The World Bank defines it as access to and the ability to use formal financial services uh, with the goal of capturing opportunities and reducing vulnerabilities. So there's been a handful of studies, um, primarily in Kenya, Mexico, and South Africa, uh, kind of looking at what the benefits are at both the micro and macro level of having access to inclusion. Um, and overall, financial access and inclusion is um, a primary economic driver for a country and one of the Millennium Development Goals. Um, but despite the widely recognized benefits, it didn't appear that this was a factor considered uh, when drafting the financial regulation, um, something that points to a much larger picture of the lack of representation of developing countries in making um, policy at uh, the international level. So I don't want to spend too much time um, in the presentation getting into what the requirement actually is, because I think it's a little more, more interesting to look at the effects. Um, but just at a high level, part of the Basel III capital requirement um, would require banks to hold a higher ratio of their capital to their risk-weighted assets. And so in order to calculate the risk weighting for the asset, the amount of the asset or exposure is multiplied by the weight assigned to the asset or exposure. So a higher risk would make a lower capital ratio. Um, so one um, clear flaw to this method is the incentive for analysts to underestimate the risk um, in order to kind of game the system and get out of having a higher ratio to be held. Um, and another uh, flaw is that most banks use internal models which are very complicated and technical and difficult for regulators to properly measure against and weigh against their own government models. Um, but what's really interesting is the implementation of this rule because although there are 27 members in the Basel Committee that drafted this regulation and all 27 of those member countries are required to implement it, there are 89 other countries that are not members of the committee who have begun implementing the rule, at least in part or in full. And so one of the main drivers for this seems to be the market pressure from global banks operating in foreign countries um, and kind of putting that pressure of that double expectation um, for these for developing country governments to adopt the same regulation that parent, com parent banks in advanced economies are adopting. So I immediately jumped into um, wanting to find concrete quantitative uh, measures of inclusion. Um, but the only public database available is by the World Bank Group, um, and they only have one time series measuring levels of inclusion in 2011, which is before Basel III was implemented. Um, but I still decided to run a handful of tests on IBM's SPSS, statistical software, with the help of my client, statistics professor. Um, and overall, um, I ran two different MANOVA multivariate analysis variance tests on two different population groups, one being low income and one being females. And within the MANOVAs, ran separate ANOVA tests um, and multiple comparisons between variables to see what um, the connections were between different levels of inclusion, which I measured as um, having a bank account, uh, having a loan, or um, credit. So those are the three main 
categories, uh, variable wise. Just jumps ahead. Um, and so the findings just supported what I'd read in the literature that countries with higher measures of inclusion uh, we're more likely to have the final rule in force. However, I also found that there are significantly large amount of countries that were adopting this rule um, as a draft that had very low levels of inclusion for both low income groups and for females. Um, I also ran non-parametric non correlations to look at the strength and direction of the association between variables um, and similarly found that countries with the rule in force were more likely to be members of the committee that drafted this, as well as advanced economies. Um, but there are significantly large number of countries that have low levels of inclusion and were not in the Basel committee that drafted it that are already implementing it. And this data is just from 2011. The World Bank is supposed to release their second set of data this week um, with levels from 2014. And so I plan on running similar tests through the 2014 database and then comparing um, to see over the three years since Basel III has been started what the differences are. Um, so Basel III has started in 2013, but its rollout is until 2019. So we won't really see most of these long-term effects um, for a few years down the road. Where I think um, this paper offers the most value add to this area is looking at some of the unintended consequences on vulnerable groups in developing countries. So um, I really like this graph because it kind of shows you at a system-wide impact what um, the application will be. So one concern is that different application of the rule between different countries will result in different waste risk weightings for parent banks that have um, subsidiaries in developing countries, which would penalize banks for having exposure to um, assets or, um, or just having exposure in developing countries. Um, we've actually already seen some global banks scale back their operations in emerging markets as a result of this and instead um, switch over to government loans, which are um, much lower risk weighted asset. And this has decreased the availability of credit and also increased the cost of credit. So what that means um, to you and I is that people who need money, who need to take out a loan, who need to have a savings account, who want to open a bank account, aren't able to do so. Um, and now I'm going to look at more um, specifically which groups are suffering the most from this. Um, the most amount of literature I found was on micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, abbreviated as MSMEs. Um, so uh, globally, there um, is a credit gap of about $2.5 trillion of unmet need in developing countries for small business owners who need credit but can't access it. 70% um, of MSMEs in developing countries are unfinanced and another 15% are underfinanced. So this presents a huge challenge um, to economic growth, but also a huge opportunity for um, international businesses to step in and meet some of those needs. Um, but three um, pieces of Basel III that might have negative outcomes looking forward on MSMEs would be, um, one is how risk is weighted. Um, so not to go too far into it, but trade credit and open lines of credit are now um, weighted at 100% risk, which they weren't before. So this increased the cost for banks in developing countries who want to do business with banks in advanced countries. And it also um, disrupts trade flows. Second is banks are deleveraging some of their assets, which I mentioned um, is decreasing the availability and the cost of credit and making MSMEs more vulnerable to the credit market conditions. And finally, um, the heightened risk aversion following the financial crisis is reflected in increased collateral requirements and interest rate spreads um, for MSMEs. Um, there's actually, I had a really difficult time finding any information on women in low income groups. Um, and financial inclusion, but was able to put um, together some charts from the World Bank um, information. Um, what we see is a persistent 9% gender gap in access to accounts for females. Um, and some of the um, 
barriers to accessing this would be discriminatory laws and regulation that prevent women from having the same status as men in society. So for example, having to have collateral in the form of land in an environment where land is only held in a man's name. Um, looking at the income gap, uh, part of um, the concern is that uh, small farmers and workers in the informal economy um, are further disadvantaged by this rule because it increases the credit requirements, um, which they already have a hard time accessing with low and inconsistent incomes. Um, and finally, just some concluding thoughts. Looking forward, um, there's a pretty recognized need for having more inclusive financial systems um, and some action steps already taken by the World Bank Group and IMF to make more um, space for decision making and representation at this level. Um, second is the public-private partnerships. I actually found a lot of literature on this topic um, looking at how banks and businesses can step in where governments can't operate necessarily. Um, one area in particular that seems to be very successful in Kenya, Brazil, and Mexico is alternative banking and mobile, mon mobile money. Um, and governments can also help um, incentivize businesses to take on these risks by subsidizing the risk um, or making a more friendly regulatory environment for these companies um, to operate. And finally, two areas of related study that I didn't touch on um, would be looking at regulation from a more macro, macro prudential point of view. So how to reform the finance system um, as a whole instead of banks individually and cross-border resolution, how a parent bank in an advanced economy uh, will react to its subsidiary in a developing country. So overall, uh, this paper was a great experience for me um, to kind of blend interdis interdisciplinary studies between finance and business with political science. Um, and I really learned just how interconnected the global economy is, and I look forward to running more tests um, when the information comes out this week. So thank you. Today's final presentation is from Courtney Smith. She is a chemistry and biology double major. Courtney is from Wyndham, New Hampshire, and next year she will be returning to New England to pursue a doctorate in pharmacology at Yale University, where she will also be joined by another one of our fellow nominees. Courtney. Thank you, Molly, for the great introduction. As she said, my name is Courtney Smith, and I'm excited to be here with you all today to share the work that I've been doing over the past year and a half, which is titled The Mechanism of Action of Metronidazole, a Nitroheterocyclic Antibiotic. So I really wanted to gear this talk a little bit more towards what I've learned over the past three few years doing research um, interspersed with some of my results, and so you can really get a clear picture of how I've grown as a scientist and a researcher and how I will carry that with me in the next few years as I pursue my PhD. So just a little bit of background information. You're probably all aware of the growing issue of antibiotic resistance in today's society. It's commonly um, in the media and in the news, um, but something that really compounds this issue is the lack of novel antibiotic classes being developed. Um, so I think this, here we go, uh, this timeline does a really great job of depicting that. So it shows the number of new antibiotic classes being developed and approved since the early 1900s. So if you look between 1940 and 1980, there are 26 new classes of antibiotics that have been developed and approved during this time period. However, if you look in the next few years from 1980 on, there are only three new classes of antibiotics being developed. So we're seeing this increase in resistance in bacteria to different classes of antibiotics, but we're not uh, following up on that and developing new classes of antibiotics that the bacteria are not yet resistant to. And so one way that we can kind of combat that problem is by pharmaceutical companies developing new drugs. Um, but another kind of way that we can, com can combat this problem is by looking back into antibiotics that are already being used and are already approved and try to determine what their mechanism, when their mechanism is currently unknown. Just on another side note, the WHO, the World Health Organization, has recognized that antibiotic resistance is an increasingly serious threat to global, health, global public health that requires action across all government sectors in society. 
So we're really at a critical time where these issues need to be considered. And so we can do this, um, specifically the set of compounds that I am look, looking at are nitroheterocyclic antibiotics. And the model compound that I'm working with is metronidazole, so this is its structure here. So just a little bit of background information about these drugs. They were developed in the 1950s and have been used ever since. They're commonly used today um, in the hospital, especially for anaerobic uh, bacterial and parasitic infections. So any sort of infection that you, you yourself may have had or you may know someone who had had in gastrointestinal systems or urogenital systems, you may have actually been prescribed one of these drugs. Um, so metronidazole, this compound here that I work with, is used for a lot of different things. So it can be used for gram-positive bacteria that cause bacterial colitis. It can also be used against gram-negative bacteria and also parasites that can in affect uh, your gastrointestinal system. So this compound has been placed on the World Health Organization's model list of essential medicine as an antibacterial compound and an anti anemic compound. So it's a great model uh, drug for us to use because it's widely used and widely studied. So, um, here we go. So when I first came onto this project, I was starting work from where another student had left off after her graduation. And so her initial results had shown that when you expose bacteria to this drug, you have an increase in this compound called nitrite. Now, to briefly explain why this is important, nitrite is the direct predecessor of ammonium. And ammonium is a critical compound that bacteria need in order to uh, pursue processes for metabolism, growth, and replication. And so, from these results, the hypothesis became that uh, by adding metronidazole, we must be inhibiting the enzyme that converts nitrite to ammonium and thus block the growth of bacteria. And so, when I came aboard, this was our, my working hypothesis. And so, my job was to try and further evaluate this hypothesis through a different method. So if we assume this hypothesis to be true, we would expect that bacteria, when grown with just ammonium, therefore able to bypass this uh, process where the metronidazole acts, should be not so sensitive to the drug. However, you would also expect that bacteria grown in the presence of nitrite would be much more sensitive to the drug as they have to go through this pathway to come up with the ammonium that they need to grow. Interestingly, um, these results did not prove to be true. And so the method of analysis that I used to test for sensitivity is called IC50. And basically what this test does is determines the concentration of drug needed to inhibit 50% of bacterial growth. So as you see on this graph here, um, this, these bacteria were grown in the presence of nitrate. So nitrate is converted to nitrite, that direct predecessor of ammonium. And when that happens, um, we have this kind of growth here. And com if you compare this with bacteria grown with ammonium, which do not have to use that enzyme that the drug targets, you see a very similar growth. And this was a little concerning to me because that's not what our hypothesis has predicted. And so I ran these experiments again and got the same result. So I talked with my advisor and I said, this is what happened. Um, I'm not sure if this is right. And she said, oh, our hypothesis was wrong. And I think that was a really great learning moment for me, um, is that your hypothesis can be wrong and that's okay. <laughs> it's important, what is important is that you follow your data. It's very true. So um, I was recently talking with my advisor about how um, sometimes science can try to chase a hypothesis and prove themselves to be right. But the most important thing is to fall where your data leads you. And if you're wrong, it's okay. It's okay to change what you know. Um, every time you do an experiment, you learn something new, and then you just uh, take a new path from there. And so that's exactly what we decided to do. So having disproved the original hypothesis, we went back and looked at the structure of metronidazole, um, but more generally the structure of the, this class of antibiotics. And what, we, I, what I noticed is that this group here is called a nitro group, this N with two O's on it, was common to every single antibiotic in this class. And so if every single antibiotic has this, it must be doing something important. That's what I thought. And so my thought was, what happens if that part of the compound isn't there? What would this structure do to the bacteria? 
And so we were fortunate enough to be able to obtain this drug, which we call desnitrometronidazole, so the drug metronidazole without this nitro group. And we studied its effects on the growth of bacteria. So in running this next set of experiments, uh, we grew bacteria with exposed to no drug as kind of a control. Then we grew bacteria exposed to the drug metronidazole, and then um, separately exposed to the dust nitro compound. And here is the readout that we get from those experiments. So I'll walk you through these graphs. Um, so on either side, we see the same results, so kind of regardless of the nitrogen source used. The control, which is shown in these circles here, follows a very steady incline of growth in both cases. However, samples of uh, bacteria exposed to metronidazole, shown by this square here, experience a significant reduction in growth. So they don't reach this peak up here that the other, the control reaches. Most interestingly, however, cultures of bacteria exposed to this dust nitro compound over here, shown with a triangle, follow a very similar, if not exactly the same growth pattern as the control. And so these results were very important and showed us that it is this nitro part of the compound that is critical for the uh, antibacterial activity of the drug. And so as I was working through this, kind of developing an, a new hypothesis and um, refining the old one, I really realized that the scientific method, this process of doing research, is a cycle. It's not something linear. There's no kind of end goal, something you're just going to keep doing. And so you start with developing an educated hypothesis. Then you perform experiments to ask questions about this hypothesis. You obtain the data from these experiments, you analyze it, and you learn something new. And with that new knowledge, you develop a new educated hypothesis. <laughs> and so it continues until you have answered your question to the best of your ability or find a new interesting question, <laughs> <laughs> which sometimes is the case. Okay, so with this new hypothesis that we developed, the importance of this nitro group of metronidazole, my next question is, what is it doing? How does it have this function? And so one thing that is known is that nitrogen radical species um, are toxic to bacteria. And so if we think about, you know, this, you could break, this is a bond between these two atoms. You could break that, and that could potentially be a reactive nitrogen species. And so um, the hope, the next hope was to be able to potentially detect this compound from bacteria exposed to this compound as proof that this reaction had happened. And if this were to be true, then that would definitely support our hypothesis that this nitro group is be being cleaved, and that is the active part of the drug that's killing the bacteria. And so to do this, um, we first went with a very straightforward method called gas chromatography mass spectrometry. It's a very scary word, but basically what the machine does, you insert a sample and it separates out all the different compounds in the sample and then determines the mass of each one. It's a really great and straightforward technique to help you identify which compounds are in a sample. And so that's what I attempted to do. I grew bacteria in the presence of metronidazole and I attempted to extract a part of this bacteria that I thought would contain this compound here. Um, and before doing that, oh, there you go. we ran a standard so that we would know what to expect when looking for this compound. So as you can see, here's our standard. It has this beautiful peak here, very clear. This is the dust nitro compound. So we get this by just running um, a small portion of the compound through the machine on its own. Then we run our experimental set through the machine, and we do not see this beautiful peak here. So this was a little frustrating, but you know, it was my first time trying this technique, and so um, I had just kind of developed it on my own, based on my own knowledge. I wasn't following any sort of protocol, and so I tweaked it a little bit, and I tweaked it a little bit again, and I tweaked it a little bit more, and still, this is what we got. Nothing. And so um, I have been actually working on this up to this past week. And so I talked with my advisor and having these struggles, and she said to me, Courtney, you are not running the right control to see if your extraction is effective. And so the problem isn't necessarily always that your experiments are incorrect, that your hypothesis is wrong, but sometimes you're not asking the, your, your question through the correct method, and that's what was happening here. So 
In an attempt to see if the extraction was successful, we ran a control where you just grow bacteria on their own. You extract them, and then, or sorry, you collect the bacteria, and then you add this dust nitro compound that we're looking for to the sample before the extraction. Now when we do that, we get the same result. And so even if you add additional dust nitro metronidazole to the sample beforehand, you still are not able to extract it. And so this set of experiments is another important lesson learned that it is the ability to recognize when the questions you are asking and when the methods you're using are not effective is an integral part of the research process. So not always only being able to recognize um, a correct result from a wrong result, but being able to recognize an incorrect method as well is very important. So although this method was not effective, um, there are other ways to potentially detect that this reaction is occurring. So we went first for the direct method and now we kind of sh uh, switched gears to a more indirect method. And so one thing is known about these toxic nitrogen species is that there are compounds that bacteria have inside them that are, have the ability to conjugate them and help protect bacteria against their harmful effects. And these compounds are called low molecular weight thiols. Now, we have some of these in our own cells and bacteria have different ones um, as well, different kinds of these thiols. At the bacteria that I work with have a compound called bacillophile. And lucky for me, we have a graduate student in the lab that I work in who is doing his PhD on this compound. Mm -hmm. And so after speaking with him a little bit, I was thought perhaps that this reaction could occur, that the bacillophile, shown here by BSH, could react with this reactive nitrogen species and form a complex that was not harmful to bacteria. And so I tried um, first to see if this potentially was um, you know, a valid thought, kind of going out on a limb here and exploring a new idea. So to do this, I tested bacteria that had bacillophile and compared them, their sensitivity to the, the antibiotic of interest to bacteria without the bacillophile. And so here is the data from those experiments. So the wild type just means that it has bacillophile, it's just normal bacteria. And you can see that there is a very low percent inhibition over a, a wide range of concentration of metronidazole until you get up to much higher concentrations. And so here we're showing this protective effect with the bacillophile. In comparison, when we were, uh, use cells that are deficient in bacillophile, we see a very significant increase in the percent inhibition starting at low concentrations. And so this is a very exciting result. It shows us that yes, this compound bacillophile does give some protective function to bacteria. And without it, the bacteria are much more sensitive to the drug. Now this is kind of a starting point. From here, we're not exactly sure how this mechanism is occurring and what is actually going on in the cell. Um, we're actively working on that in the lab, but one thing that we have shown is that this compound is something you can actually make. So um, the graduate student who I worked with uh, through this project has been able to show that this compound B snow, so that's the complex of bacillophile um, with these reactive nitrogen species is accurate, uh, is able to be formed. So. Um, from these experiments, kind of the general lesson here is don't be afraid to explore a new idea you're not completely sure about. Sometimes these results are the most exciting, and that is certainly the case for me here. So just to kind of wrap up with some um, personal thoughts about my research here at Wake, it's been for sure one of the most fulfilling um, and exciting and challenging parts of my academic life at Wake, and I'm very excited to take what I have learned here and uh, move forward with that as I continue to get my PhD. So with that, I would like to thank the, my advisors and members of the lab that I work in, as well as Wake Forest Department of Chemistry for their funding, and thank you all for your time. I realize it's been a long presentation, but I do appreciate your attention, so thank you. At this time, I would like to invite all five of our presenters up for a joint question and answer. So if any of you have questions for our presenters, um, please go ahead and get them formulated 
as we will have time for that now. Do we have questions? Yes. We are recording, so oh. the mic would be helpful. <laughs> um, cool, yeah, so abortion. So I actually, one of the women that I interviewed works for Efrat, which is an organization that deals with women who feel like they can't afford to have their pregnancy and provides them all sorts of resources to ensure that they actually do go through with it and that financial limitations are not the reason that they're not having children. Um, and so through our conversation that ended up being like four and a half hours, super fascinating, learned a lot. Um, so basically, abortion is very legal in Israel, and it's legal with no ending, which is really interesting. But in order to get an abortion approved, you need to go in front of the committee and share your case. And something like 98% of abortions are approved if you go through this process. Um, and typically, women who are going through this process are doing it because not because they can't afford it, because there's a lot of organizations that support it, and the Israeli government actually gives money to anyone who has kids. You kind of get like social security for your kid up until the age of 18 every month. It's amazing. Parents are like all about it. Um, but it's really because of like an unsafe circumstance that this would happen. So people who go and get abortion specifically raise incest. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, there's adoption for women who decide they don't want the abortion. Awesome. Really interesting topic. It's by religion in Israel, which is really unique. Um, so only Jewish families can adopt Jewish children. Muslim families can adopt Muslim children, and Christian families can adopt Muslim and Christian children, which is really interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, another question from Shosh. Um, kind of on that same note, maybe in some of your surveys or interviews, did you pick up on a certain type of style for that universal health care, do you feel like it's more preventative or more of like a diagnosis and treat? Because once those babies are born, there's going to be a lot of children who need to be cared for ongoing, and because of that, that could cause some economic strain for the health care system. So with the universal health care system and really this infertility recruitment policy, generally the idea is the more children the better. We can afford to have children, children are going to be our future. Um, to the point really where it's not the children that are the burden on the system, but the infertility treatment itself. So because the age is so high, 45, most women, I mean, the, there's an entire study that I looked at that looked at the rates of pregnancy with various infertility treatments, how many they have, how old they are. And so for 45-year-old women who've gone 17 times, your chance is like 0. 0. 0. 0. 0. 1 of getting pregnant. But the state's still paying for it. Um, so the real issue is that the state is putting so much money into infertility treatments for women who are never going to get pregnant, but feel like it's a social right, not an actual medical procedure to have infertility treatment and to be able to have a child. Um, and there was a bunch of lawsuits that just happened about this. It just got up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court actually decided that even if the woman has gone through something like, I think it was 21, but this case, 21 in future mobilization cycles is crazy. Like, that's your entire life. It takes up all of your time, all of your energy, a ton of money on half the, on half of the insurance company, but also you're paying for some of these hormonal drugs, so you have some personal investment in it as well. Um, and so the woman still wanted to keep going, even though everyone's probably like, it's not gonna happen. Like, look at adoption, adoption's still very real. Um, and Supreme Court ruled that they had to keep paying. Yeah. I have a question. Um, again, since there's required military service in Israel, um, what happens if someone gets pregnant while they're in the military service? That's a really great question. So it's kind of complicated based on 
what your position is, mm -hmm. it's actually kind of awkward, but like if you're a secretary for an officer, you get three free abortions. Yeah. Just three like free happens. abortions? Yeah. Um, I haven't like, looked very heavily into that, but I have friends who are in the military that are like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah. but in general, it's like you get to choose whether or not you want to have the abortion, whether or not you want to continue the service. Um, in general, women really aren't serving for that long, yeah. and there's a lot of death jobs that they can position you into. Okay. Maybe it's going to be pretty good care. That's going to happen for sure with women. Did you have a second question? I have a question for Rachel, actually. Um, Rachel Ryan. Um, I wanted to ask if, besides William Ashford series, have you seen other examples of Irish travel painters um, kind of in that era um, catering to an audience in a way that they use like strategies from um, English paintings and English portraiture and English landscape? Well, generally, um, yes. <laughs> The interesting thing about Irish art at this time is there's so much that's tied to England that basically if you're studying British art, you're also studying Irish art because there's so many close ties. But the slight difference was the Irish were more influenced by the continent as well. So when we're seeing, especially at this point, was just when the Royal Hibernian Academy was starting, we're starting to see institutions emerging that can train artists. And a lot of their inspiration was coming from England. And at that particular time, you see a lot of the influence in the picturesque, some in portraiture as well, and a lot of transmission of actual artists. So you have, for example, um, William Ashford was actually English. He immigrated to Ireland when he was 18, so he's considered an English artist. But most of the time, you see that going the opposite way. Uh, one of the most famous was Tom, Thomas Roberts, who moved, he was out. 25 to London because he couldn't get enough work in Dublin. So there's so much transmission of the artists that this really was very, very common. It was just this particular example was an unusual choice of the artists to use. Most of them use these things much more successfully. Can I ask one? Yes. Rachel? It's English Irish back and forth, lots of visiting. Did they do much on the continent? Yes, actually, I wish I'd had time to get into that. Um, I consider the picturesque tour to really be an offshoot of what was called the Grand Tour, which was a really popular movement um, prior to the 18th century and including into the 18th century that was mainly upper class individuals. It was to capstone their education, they would go visit Europe and go to these monumental sites in Rome, go to France. It was a very aristocratic thing to do. And what you see that was really interesting is this tour, the picturesque was being, it was called the picturesque tour, and you have these guidebooks similar, similarly to the um, continental tours, which were also, they were cutting back on, not only because the more middle class could afford it, and could do these picturesque tours, but there's so much conflict between the continent and the islands at this point that less people are traveling to the continent that you do see very similar interactions. And mainly what was fascinating was the Grand Tour had an even more apparent marketplace. Like you see massive amounts of engravings, copying, <coughs> um, people bringing back actual statues, the travel industries were really, really common at this point. This was just an interesting one because it was not only the very top echelons of the aristocracy that were going to Europe, but was much more the middle class as well. So I have a question for Carolyn, because I find that um, the interplay sort of between the netizens and China really interesting. But I was struck when you said that the former head of Google sort of went sort of expatted himself, right, and moved to Taiwan. Is there a, a role in China um, for that netizen from an expat community? Like from outside China, are there Chinese activists that are trying to work with them? D did you find any of that? Yeah, yeah, so there definitely are. Um, there's a really interesting guy named Xiao Chang working out of Berkeley that runs the China Digital Times. and. Um, it's a popular website, but it also just like watchdogs every 
um, censorship issue that's going through China, whereas like you and I looking for that wouldn't be able to find it. Um, so he has a team out of Berkeley working on that. Um, the thing that happened with Li Kai Fu was, I mean, he's still active as like a, he's Chinese, you know, by nationality. Um, but he had pushed the limit so many times and his blog kept getting shut down for like five days a day. He would like be brought in for questioning, et cetera, that um, he was like approaching um, a limit where he saw others like him be arrested. Um, and that's why he, he left and he's in Taiwan now. But his business is all run through China. He runs Innovation Works, which is like a angel fund and startup accelerator. I know your research wasn't about microfinancing and microlending, but do any of the big banks recognize the need for microfinancing and do they have microfinancing arms where they can get around the Basel rules or is that like those worlds don't uh, Thank you for your question. Um, that is really interesting in an area where a lot of non, a lot of more startups um, are coming in to the mobile banking realm. Um, some banks are able to kind of finagle through the regulation by having different subsidiaries of different legal entities um, operating in developing countries, but it's more of the startup, entrepreneurial, um, kind of tech business combinations that we see meeting that microfinance need. Um, and in the U.S., after the um, crisis, the government um, subsidized some of the microfinancing for small businesses, but that was a short-term solution. So long-term, um, we're kind of seeing, we'll wait to see um, you know, if the market picks up how that works or if the government will continue to subsidize um, small business lines in the U.S. Um, as well as in our country. I actually have a question for Courtney. Um, so Courtney, in your research, you, you showed the, the timeline there at the very beginning where there were, I think you said, 26 classes of um, drugs developed sort of middle of the 20th century and then from the 80s on we've only had three classes. Can you actually give background as to why that is? Um, what was it that either stopped research in that area and development in that area or stopped successful sure. research or development? So as I kind of understand, um, there was an explosion around that time where the method of developing these novel antibiotics was to look through soil bacteria. And so one of the these bacteria used to thrive and dominate in the soil is to produce some of these antibiotics. And so, um, to like kill other bacteria and prevent their growth. And so, what you might say that you could use is to look through these bacteria and um, try and gather some of the metabolites that they make to be toxic to other bacteria and build off of those. Um, now, there are much more efficient ways of making drugs that are much more rapid. Um, and I don't think that antibiotics really are a part of that movement, as I understand. So um, I think too much effort, not enough benefit coming back. Um, and producing a drug is an extremely time, ex time and cost expensive process. And so um, pharmaceutical companies are going to look for easy money mm -hmm. a lot of the times um, and not go after those harder targets. And so, any sort of drug that would target um, bacteria knowing that was easy has already been done at this point, and so now it's a little bit more difficult. Um, so hopefully, pharmaceutical companies will recognize that lack and start getting into gear before we're going to serious issues. Yeah. Right. Yes, kind of a follow-up on that. Um, and so, kind of in addition, I'm not sure if your are left just focused on that or your field of interest, but I know that there's been alternatives to antibiotics that can the research and treat like liposome sort of treatment and like bacterial bait and that sort of thing. So do you think that may play also a role in drug development and like what gets funded and what doesn't be seen as almost like an outdated sort of drug even though for specific things that may be necessary? Yeah, for sure. I think there are definitely other mechanisms that you could use um so I'm in a microbiology class right now looking at we've really been talking about this antibiotic resistance and what can you do to um, so one thing that we talk about is you could develop drugs rather than targeting bacteria to target the toxins that they produce. Um, so you know, you're not pushing the bacteria to evolve into form resistance, but rather just um, treat
treating or detoxifying what the actual problem is. So I definitely think um, because bacteria is rapidly evolving, it's really easy to form in resistance. And so even with new antibacterial compounds that may come onto the market, and I don't know for sure that you could ever say that resistance will stop. And so I think those alternative therapeutics are going hopefully. Enjoy all your research projects uh, for whatever that's worth. And I'm going to uh, conduct one of my own right now by asking you, uh, s each of you, to answer a very simple question. Do any of you have that dream as you're about to graduate from Wake Forest, where you're in a class and you're about to take a test and you realize you've never been in that class before? And you don't know <laughs> You, are you getting that dream now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, no? You've never had that dream? Thank you. Congratulations to you. 